Hi, you're watching Nursing F. Today we're going to be talking about pediatric respiratory emergencies as part of our paramedic summer education series for pediatrics. First, let's start off by reviewing some of the anatomy differences between the pediatric airway and the adult airway. Children, newborns up to you know, usually about their first cold, are obligate nose breathers, which means that they don't even know that they could open their mouth to breathe. So if they get mucus buildup or swelling or edema in the mucous membranes, um, they will just continue to struggle to breathe through narrowed nasal passages rather than opening their mouths. Until about the age of two, they use their abdominal muscles to breathe while their diaphragm is developing. In general, children have faster respiratory rates than adults until about age 12. And infants very particularly breathe on a true hypercarbic drive. And so they have very irregular patterned breathing that if you plot it out, almost looks like chain stokes because they'll breathe faster and deeper as their CO2 levels rise, and then it will slow down again. It's not uncommon for new parents to get very scared about this, and sometimes we'll get called to evaluate a baby who they felt had stopped breathing. So periods of apnea up to like five, six seconds are actually pretty normal in the newborn. The apoglottis in a child um, is floppy and U-shaped. The glottis is more anterior and superior. And the cricoid ring is the smallest diameter of the airway. So these last three things, the epiglottis being floppy and U-shaped, the glottis being more anterior and superior, and the cricoid being so narrow, make a child um, at high risk for difficult airway management. So if there's any inflammation or edema, inhalation burns, anaphylaxis, um, the airway around the glottic opening gets very swollen and structures are more difficult to visualize. So intubation is going to be a greater challenge. And then foreign body airway obstruction and aspiration with the cricoid as the smallest diameter increase the risk of the foreign body making it past the vocal cords and into the trachea. And this is one of the reasons why we've removed the blind finger sweeps, because if there is an item there, we don't accidentally want to push it down and, and into the trachea. PD airway positioning is also different than with an adult. And here you see an infant in the sniffing position requires like a shoulder roll, so padding underneath the upper thorax, and then also um, padding underneath the head to bring all of the structures in alignment. And for those of you in the Vermont Tech Paramedic class, I have posted links to a couple different articles that you can look at that really do a nice job illustrating um, how to effectively assess your landmarks and positioning to make sure that you get your infant and pediatric patients into the best position possible. So if you do have to intubate an infant or a child, the landmarks are the same as with the adult, um, but obviously the hole <laughs> is much smaller. So the opening between the vocal folds is going to be much smaller. Um, and again, uh, this is not the smallest point of their airway. So just because an ET tube, you can make it you know, fit through there, does not mean that um, it will actually fit into the cricoid ring. So the current recommendation is to use an un or sorry, a cuffed tube rather than an uncuffed tube, but don't inflate it unless you have a leak. So intubate with the cuffed tube without inflating the cuff and then ventilate and listen for a leak. And if you have an air leak, then go ahead and inflate the cuff just enough to stop the air from leaking. Mm -hmm. 
So let's take a look at those structures. You can see that the structures are the same as with the adult, um, but you can see that the epiglottis is uh, more U-shaped or kind of uh, Omicron-shaped, and um, you know the structures themselves are, are clean and usually easy to identify. It's the trick of proper alignment, getting them into a good position so you can really get that view. So it'd be nice if every pediatric patient had this beautiful, easy view when you went in. The Malin potty scoring that we use for adults is not used in children under 18 months of age, and it's difficult to do in children under the age of five. The Cormac leaning grading scale can still be used. Um, so, you know, you can do a Malin potty score on a kid you know, five or older, um, but you know, that it doesn't necessarily correlate with the uh, Cormac Leany grade. So just an example of grade one, two, three, and four, uh, when you get in there, um, grade three and four are going to be incredibly difficult to manage, um, if not impossible. And I included a picture just to kind of show you um, how those two kind of line up together. But the classes and the grades, again, don't necessarily align. There's like some overlap. Um, grade three and four with direct laryngoscopy, so the Cormac Lini grade is going to be, again, a very difficult airway. Um, so you always want to have your failed airway plan in place prior to laryngoscopy. Um, and um, the Malin potty, because the child's tongue is so large, like disproportionately large compared to that of an adult, um, your Malin potty may look awful, but your uh, Cormac Laney grade may actually be okay. Um, after intubation, we want to place an OG tube uh, to decompress the stomach. Any child who's received positive pressure ventilations likely has um, gastric air and uh, that can impede um, you know, adequate ventilation because it's up against the diaphragm. The OG tube size should be twice the ET tube size. So you know, if you have a newborn and you're putting in a 4.0 tube, then you want an eight French OG tube. Um, if you're using a syringe on the OG tube, you need that cath tip syringe and aspirate gently for air and gastric contents. Um, you can put air into it and oscillate over the um, epigastrum, so over the stomach, and you'll hear kind of this burbly toilet flushing sound um, that tells you that the end of the tube is in the right spot. Remember for an OG tube, you measure it almost like you would um, an OPA. So it goes from the corner of the mouth, um, you know, to the angle of the jaw and then down to the xiphoid process. And that is the length of the OG tube that you're going to insert. Um, ideally, you're gonna use suction. So you need a little adapter to connect your suction hose, the tubing to the OG tube. Um, I typically take one inch tape and tape my OG tube to my ET tube. I know that's not what it says to do in the book, but that's usually what I do. Um, but uh, if you want, you can just tape it to the corner of the mouth using kind of like a, a chevron type of uh, taping. What you don't want to do is um, put it in the tube holder and use like the screw down uh, mechanism to hold the tube in place and es essentially kink off the OG tube. Um, so suction is ideal. Intermittent low wall suction is the best if you can make that work in your truck. Um, and you want to just set it to like 20 to 40 millimeters of mercury. So just really low suction. And the intermittent setting just does this on off on off all by itself. Um, if you don't have that, just use continuous low, like at 20 to 40. Again, the goal for this is just to get the air out. The goal is not to um, evacuate gastric contents. So it's not important that it's the suction is strong enough to actually be able to like suck out uh, gastric acid. So 
Moving on. Let's talk about some common complaints of pediatric respiratory calls. So when you get dispatched to a child, and remember, a child is anyone up to the age of 18, so the anatomy and the physiology um, and just the knowledge base and communication abilities are widely varied uh, throughout the age ranges. So when we get called to something like shortness of breath, coughing, um, adventitious sounds like strider or wheezing, a person who has a complete or partial airway obstruction and they're choking, um, somebody who's drooling, they can't swallow, or uh, infants who are having difficulty feeding, um, or even kids with fevers, uh, we think about, you know, could this potentially be respiratory? And it's important to remember that most uh, causes of pediatric cardiac arrest are directly related to respiratory compromise and hypoxia, which causes acidosis um, and bradycardia and then um, you know, cardiovascular collapse and death. Uh, so we want to kind of cast that wide net when we're getting dispatched and we're doing our pre-arrival prep and we're thinking about all of the things that could be and what we want to take with us. Um, but always keep in mind, you know, that a lot of these um, complaints, even if they seem kind of vague, can be respiratory in nature. And then the causes of those, so the underlying causes for those dispatches or chief complaints include things like uh, foreign bodies, upper airway edema, which could be caused by things like anaphylaxis, croup syndromes, epiglottitis, um, and even bacterial tracheitis, and then lower airway inflammation like asthma, RSV, bronchiolitis, pneumonia, and pertussis. And then we have chronic diseases like cystic fibrosis and bronchopulmonary dysplasia, as well as um, other you know, congenital defects or chronic diseases that can impact the respiratory system. So we wanna kind of keep all of those things in mind and um, always anticipate the worst case scenario when you're planning for what you need to take in with you. It's really important that we can be able to distinguish between respiratory distress and respiratory failure in any patient. But again, in the pediatric patient, this is really critical because we need to recognize distress early and intervene before we progress to failure because respiratory failure and arrest cause cardiovascular collapse. So respiratory distress occurs when the child can compensate. So we kind of think of this as like compensated respiratory shock um, by increasing their work of breathing and altering the position. So whether it's sniffing position or tripod position in order to maintain adequate oxygenation and ventilation. Um, so in respiratory distress, the mental status is normal or only slightly impaired, like the person might feel irritable or a little anxious or restless, but they're still with it and they can follow commands. Signs of respiratory distress include pallor and mottled skin, irritability, tachypnea, tachycardia, um, and slight uh, increased work of breathing that if not treated will get worse and then adventitious sounds. So we can have strider on inspiration, we can have wheezes on exhalation, and we could have crackles um, and inspiratory crackles um, or expiratory ronchi. So we could have any of those things depending on the underlying cause. Respiratory failure then occurs um, and impending respiratory arrest when the attempt to compensate fail. So either we didn't recognize it, we didn't intervene, or their condition is getting worse. And a pediatric patient who doesn't have um, immediate intervention and assistance with oxygenation and positive pressure ventilation if needed, um, will get fatigued. And so then they'll go from this increased work of breathing to decreased work of breathing and then arrest. Hypoxia and evidence of respiratory failure um, and failure to perfuse the brain and the skin become present with respiratory failure. Bradypnea then occurs as the child becomes really fatigued. This leads to hypoxia and acidosis, which causes then bradycardia. Um, so the, the myocardium gets depressed in an acidotic and hypoxic state. 
Um, this causes decreased cardiac output and cardiovascular collapse. Cyanosis is always a late finding, and that's really important to kind of like write that somewhere on a wall, like here's your sign. Um, if you have reached the point where your child is cyanosis, cyanotic, then you missed the boat uh, early on. Um, so uh, cyanosis is, could be present again late finding. Decreased mental status, so we'll start to see that fatigue and that kind of lethargy. Uh, bradypnea, then apnea, bradycardia, hypoxia, severe dyspnea, and uh, again, adventitious sounds. It's the responsibility of the paramedic to recognize and respond to the signs and symptoms of respiratory distress before the, the condition progresses to respiratory failure and arrest. All right, so we're going to talk about some specific conditions, starting with upper airway emergencies. Um, and the first one is foreign body airway obstructions. Uh, these can be partial or complete. Remember, if the child can cough, speak, breathe, we want to encourage them to continue coughing. Um, you know, this could be any range of things. Children are phenomenal for putting everything in their mouth. They explore the world around them by comparing whatever it is that they're holding with things that they know, right? So if you have a child um, who uh, breastfed, they would compare the size and the shape and the, you know, firmness to a nipple. If you have a child who is bottle fed, again, they would compare the size, the shape and the firmness to um, the, the nipple on the bottle. And that's how they kind of like, you know, gauge things in their world. So they're always putting everything in there. Um, the things that have the highest choking hazards are things that are kind of smooth and round or oval um, that really kind of fit down into the airway well, but um, can completely obstruct the airway. So these are things like hot dog slices, uh, grapes, um, M&Ms or round candies. Uh, lifesavers, you know, are called lifesavers because they have a hole in the middle so a kid can still breathe through them if they get stuck in their throat. Um, and then any number of uh, toys, balls, things like that. Um, coins are another thing that kids tend to put in their mouth. Uh, so, you know, with the current um, CPR guidelines, we are doing um, back blows and chest thrusts on an infant or um, you know, abdominal thrusts on a child until they become unresponsive. And once they lose that muscle tone and they become kind of, you know, flaccid, you're going to uh, lay them down, position them to try to keep the airway open, and you're going to initiate the steps of CPR. The only difference with regular CPR and choking CPR is that before you try to ventilate, you're going to look in the mouth. So you're going to just kind of pull the, um, the, like to like a tongue jaw lift, just pull the jaw forward. You want to look in the mouth to see if uh, the, you can see the object that was in there. If so, you can turn the head to the side and do a finger sweep from like the top towards the ground uh, to try to sweep it out, or you can use your McGill's to remove it. Um, and if not, then we're not going to do blind finger sweeps. So uh, when, the, when the child is in arrest, you can go ahead and do direct laryngoscopy and use your McGill's to remove an object. Children who were treated for foreign body airway obstruction should always be transported to the ER because they can have delayed uh, swelling and kind of subglottic edema and they can have kind of secondary respiratory distress from the, um, the trauma of having an object in there. Anaphylaxis, we know, is a systemic, widespread, hypervigilant allergic reaction, so our immune system has kind of gone overboard. And this could be to a known or an unknown substance. In general, we're not allergic to something the first time we're exposed to it, but we do then generate those B helper cells and memory cells. And then the second time we're exposed to those protein tags on a cell surface, we recognize them as foreign, and we kind of create this counterattack and, and go after them. Um, the whole immunity 
immune response, inflammatory response then causes vasodilation and increases capillary permeability to deliver all of the um, cells that are needed in order to fight off the infection or the invasion. And so this is what causes that third spacing or the hives, the urticaria is leaky capillaries. Similar to um, sepsis or uh, burns, when we have fluid that's leaking out of the vascular system, it can cause uh, massive fluid shifts into that intracellular space, which is considered the third space when we talk about third spacing or peripheral edema. And the way to treat this then is with an alpha drug like epinephrine, which causes um, vasoconstriction. So we want something that will kind of counteract that uh, chemical response that's making all of our blood vessels and our capillaries dilate and leak. Um, epinephrine has the added benefit of also having beta properties. So beta one is going to increase cardiac output by increasing the heart rate and the force and the automaticity. And beta two stimulation from epinephrine is going to increase pulmonary blood flow and dilate the pulmonary uh, branches. So it increases airflow through the lungs and then oxygenation and gas exchange across the alveoli. So it really is the perfect drug for anaphylaxis. The diagnosis of anaphylaxis requires two body systems being involved. So you can't just have somebody who has like some localized hives. It really needs to be systemic. And then you either need to have um, hypotension or, you know, stridor or wheezing or angioedema or something else, but it can't just be like a localized skin thing that you use epinephrine for. The uh, dose for epinephrine is 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram for kids and uh, typically max out at 0 0.3 milligrams, which is the dose for like an adult EpiPen. Um, and so that would be a kid who weighs roughly 30 kilos or 66 pounds, uh, which tends to be about our nine year old. So younger kids, um, you know, and obviously all kids are different, right? There's four year olds that are 66 pounds, but um, younger kids, uh, you know, that the EpiPen Junior is 0 0.15 uh, milligrams, which is the perfect dose for about a three year old. Uh, Croup syndromes. So Croup itself is not actually a diagnosis. It's not a thing. It's uh, laryngotracheobronchitis. Um, Croup syndromes uh, include things like laryngomalacia and spasmodic laryngitis. Um, <clears throat> and those are considered to be like benign. And then the acute uh, laryngotracheobronchitis or LTB is what we usually refer to as Croup. This is a um, kind of post viral subglottic uh, edema that usually occurs in younger kids. So like up until about the age of five or six, and it occurs um, usually two to three days after the onset of a viral upper respiratory tract infection. So if you think like runny nose, sinus infection kind of thing. And uh, because again, kids are obligate nose breathers, they kind of sniff in the uh, mucus that's infected and it runs down the back of the throat and then it causes inflammation in that area. The um, hallmark signs and symptoms of croup include things like inspiratory stridor um, and a seal like or barking um, brassy type of cough. And it tends to be worse at night when our histamine levels are highest. And then it improves with uh, going outside in the cold air. Uh, most of our upper respiratory tract infections are most prominent in the winter. 
Um, and a lot of times because the kid is so congested, the parents or caregivers will take the kid in the shower to try to decongest some of that or in the bath, try to decongest some of that mucus. Um, the kid still seems like they're getting worse, so they take them outside to drive them to the ER. They put them in the car, and by the time they get to the ER, they're so much better, and the parents are saying, I swear they were so sick, and we're like, yeah, we know. Um, you did the right thing by getting them outside. So really, this is just a viral infection. They don't need antibiotics or anything. We do sometimes give them um, steroids. You could use racemic epinephrine for the strider, so that kind of splatters against the upper airway and causes localized uh, vasoconstriction, which then decreases the edema above the airway. Um, and this is very similar to the action of like a nasal spray. So when you spray something up your nose, it gets on those mucous membranes and it causes them to constrict and decreases swelling and mucosal edema. The same is true with racemic or nebulized epinephrine, um, and that gets onto those uh, subglottic tissues and causes vasoconstriction, which decreases the edema. Um, so, you know, other than that, there's not much to do. If the child has a fever, we could give Tylenol, but for the most part, um, this is very self-limiting and the child will get better and you know over the next seven to ten days because most viruses are self-limiting and go away within seven to ten days in the ed if you're interested um, the child will have a neck soft tissue film and the kind of hallmark sign of croup is what's called a steeple sign so if you look in here this is the swelling Sorry, I just gotta switch over to my pen. Um, so this is the, the airway here, and you can see that it's really narrowed up through here. And then it has this kind of steeple looking, well, I didn't do a great job tracing that, but this is kind of steeple looking structure. Um, so this is the trachea right here. And um, this obviously is the airway uh, and the, the head up here. Uh, so we've got clavicle, clavicle, I think I have it on highlight instead, um, and then the, the neck. So that, that sign, that steeple sign is, is pretty, um, uh, I want to say, I guess, particular to a croup, and croup syndrome. Epiglottitis then is a bacterial infection. So where croup came on slowly over days and is worse at night, epiglottitis is bacterial. So it is a sudden onset, usually accompanied with a high fever where viral infections tend to have a low grade fever. Um, and uh, because it's a swelling of the epiglottis, which is in you know the back of the throat, like behind the tongue and over the airway, um, the child can't lay down or it will flop down and cover their airway and they can't breathe. So you'll find them sitting in a tripod and or sniffing position based on the age. Typically this impacts kids between like one and seven or two or seven years of age. Um, and then they, you know, oftentimes they'll be drooling because they can't swallow because the epiglottis is so large. Uh, they get a muffled voice or what's referred to as like a hot potato voice, like they're like they're eating something, like they're eating something really hot and they, they can't vocalize around it. Um, strider, so inspiratory strider is considered to be a late finding. And um, the cause for epiglottitis is usually mophilus influenza B or Hib uh, that we vaccinate against. So at two, four and six months of age, um, we give the hip vaccine. Um, if somebody was not vaccinated as a child, then they you know, can get vaccinated as a teenager or an adult for this as well. We do know that our immune system kind of changes um, as we age. And some say that like every seven years it resets itself or it changes what you're allergic to. But we do know that vaccines lose their efficacy over time if you're not exposed. Um, so uh, we do see some epiglottitis in our like older teens. Um, younger adults as they go off to college. And then we also see this in our elderly population sometimes as well. So just because we talk about it in pediatrics doesn't mean that it can't impact um, other people.
if you were to visualize the airway, and this is not with the laryngoscope, this is just having the person open their mouth, stick out their tongue and say, ah, you can see that big swollen epiglottis in the back. And it's not normal to be able to see much of an epiglottis, if any at all. Like sometimes you can just see the tip of it. So you can see how big and uh, swollen it is. And if you were to use your laryngoscope and look in there, on the left you have a normal pediatric uh, trachea, and then on the right you have epiglottitis. Um, so if uh, the general rule of thumb is if the child is managing their airway, even though they're drooling and they can't control their secretions, um, nothing in the mouth. We don't look in there, we don't do anything that might cause them to panic and spasm. We try not to start IVs or give shots or anything else that could make the child cry or scream because again, it can cause a spasm and we could lose their airway. If you are having signs of impending respiratory failure and you think you're gonna to have to intubate this kid, do it fast. So do it as soon as you know it's necessary and always use an ET tube uh, one to two sizes smaller than what you would have used for that child. So let's say a four-year-old, so uh, four plus 16 is uh, 20 divided by four is a size 5O tube. Um, then we would go with uh, like a 4O, right? So a, a two sizes down would be a 4O. One size down would be four and a half. So we'd get out like a 4O tube, right? And that's like a newborn ET tube. Um, and then we would have uh, obviously suction and everything else ready. The other thing I want to tell you is that this tissue is very friable when it is inflamed like this, and that means that all those blood vessels are right at the surface, and it just takes a little bit of <clears throat> poking or trauma to cause hemorrhage into the airway. So make sure that you have your suction set up and that you're in a as controlled as possible uh, setting when or if you ever attempt to intubate a kid who's losing their airway. Uh, bacterial tracheitis then um, is you know another thing that's considered to be an upper airway problem. Uh, this comes usually from Staph aureus or um, methicillin resistant Staph aureus MRSA and the presentation is both a little like croup and epiglottitis where the, the per person really had like a recent viral infection um, and usually they have a fever and a cough Sometimes they develop strider, sometimes they get that muffled voice, sometimes they have some drooling. Um, but what really stands out is that this is like viral with really severe throat pain and they have copious amounts of mucus and sputum that they're bringing up. So you got this like little kid who has like this, you know, 60 pack here smoker cough. It's just like terribly purulent. Um, and they oftentimes will put themselves in the sniffing or tripod position. Again, there's nothing we can do for this in the field, position of comfort, reassurance, transport rapidly. This child's gonna require um, antibiotics to treat that. And any child with a fever and a cough, you need to have on, just like with an adult, eye protection and a mask. Some other things that uh, can impact our ability to manage the airway in a pediatric patient include things like uh, strep throat, so uh, strep pharyngitis and tonsillitis. Um, so we'll just talk about strep, but this also can be caused by other things that can be caused by a virus, it can be caused by mononucleosis, all of those things. Um, but the take home message is there's really not much room in that airway back there. So a strep infection can cause problems with breathing and swallowing. Um, it can also cause uh, abscesses um, so we can get like pharyngeal abscesses, retropharyngeal abscesses. Um, if untreated, and one of the reasons why we're pretty serious about the management of strep infections is if untreated, it can lead to acute glomerulonephritis, which if you remember is where we're spilling uh, protein and blood out of the kidneys. So it causes kidney failure and like massive um, edema or it can cause what's known as rheumatic fever. And this then later causes things like uh, rheumatic heart disease and, and kidney problems as an adult. Um, 
So if you see this, you know, try not to put anything in the airway. This just gets treated with antibiotics. There is a movement afoot uh, to not prescribe so many antibiotics. And so um, there are some people, if they have mild cases, that they're just uh, having, you know, monitor. This is lymphatic tissue that is so inflamed here and has the purulent discharge on it. And um, in theory, most people can fight off a strep pharyngitis on their own without antibiotics. Um, but the people who are genetically prone to rheumatic fever, uh, which you wouldn't know uh, until you get it, <laughs> the people who are prone to rheumatic fever then are the ones that we're trying to protect when we do prescribe uh, antibiotics. All right, so let's move on to some lower airway emergencies. Um, and these where upper airway emergencies tend to be problems with inspiration, so a narrowed upper airway. Lower airway emergencies uh, include problems with exhalation and gas exchange. So we'll start with asthma, which is probably one of the most common uh, you know, pediatric uh, respiratory problems. And this is kind of this uh, triple threat of um, inflammation and mucosal edema. So the mucous membranes in the respiratory tract become engorged. And then bronchial smooth muscle constriction um, because they sense inflammation and they're trying to clamp down to prevent whatever it is that's irritating the tissue from getting any deeper in the airways. And then this excess mucus production and our airways secrete mucus when they're inflamed as a protective measure. So you can see here um, in this asthmatic bronchiole on the right that there is bronchoconstriction, mucosal edema, and excess um, mucus production. So uh, kids and adults start out with um, expiratory wheezing and a cough. And there is such a thing as cough variant asthma where the child doesn't really have um, much or any wheezing at all. And as this progresses, is it, if it's left untreated, then they'll have both inspiratory and expiratory wheezes. So you'll start to hear wheezes on the way in as well as wheezes on the way out. And that's not strider, it's just that the airway is getting narrow enough that you're starting to hear air movement in both directions. And then again, if it continues to progress, you'll still be able to hear those inspiratory sounds, but there's so much air trapping and so little air flow that you really won't hear anything on the way out. So it goes first expiratory, so mild is expiratory wheezing, moderate is inspiratory expiratory wheezing, severe is just inspiratory wheezing, and then that could progress to what we call silent chest where you can't hear air movement at all. So um, obviously not everything that wheezes is asthma, but in kids it's usually a pretty good bet rather than like adults that could have what we refer to as cardiac asthma, which is just fluid in those um, bronchioles. Um, but when those wheezing sounds decrease, it's really critical that you reassess work of breathing, mental status, circulation to skin, like really go back through the PAT and reassess this child to see if they're actually getting better or if they're getting worse and you just can't hear air movement anymore. Uh, bronchodilators. So we're going to start with our beta-2 agonists like albuterol or ibotropium. Those work to decrease um, the bronchial constriction. So they, they work on that bronchial smooth muscle to decrease constriction. Um, and as they open up those airways uh, and decrease some of that edema, um, the patient may cough more at first, which is totally normal because we're able to get air now past that mucus. And as we exhale, it's bringing it back up. Um, and so, you know, I like to reassure them like, oh, good, you're coughing. That means the medicine's working. We can pair that with ipratropium bromide, which is atrovent, uh, which literally means ventilated or inhaled atropine, right? So it's an anticholinergic. And the way that it works is to decrease the parasympathetic or vagus response, which is bronchoconstriction. 
Um, so it basically, the way I like to think about it is that atrovent makes albuterol more effective. So atrovent stops the uh, parasympathetic stimulation or constriction, and then that allows the albuterol to be more effective. So the rescue drug really is that um, albuterol or leave albuterol and not the ipratropium but the ibuprofen will make the albuterol more effective in the management of asthma. One of the things that's happening with asthma in kids that's so scary for us is that they are really um, technologically advanced at managing their asthma at home. They have asthma action plans, which they've created with their um, primary care providers, their pediatricians, and the school nurse even can use those. And these really say like, this is what their peak flow should be, and this is when they're in trouble, and. Um, you know, this is what to do based on um, how much air they're moving and what their symptoms are. Typically, when they call us, they have maxed out everything. So, it, you know, usually these aren't the people who are like, oh, yeah, I just left my inhaler at home and I didn't have it. These are the people who are like, you know, I've been struggling for days. Um, and research tells us that um, the asthma response that you have today is accumulation of exposures and inflammation over the last seven days. Um, so typically when patients call us uh, with an asthma attack, especially our pediatric patients, it's because they've tried everything at home and it's not getting better. And that usually means that there's little to nothing that we have in the truck that's going to make them better other than our reassurance and our ability to beat feet through traffic. Um, it is really important that from the patient or the guardian, you get the information about whether or not this child has ever been um, hospitalized with their asthma, how many times they've been to the emergency room in the last year with their asthma, how many times they're using their rescue inhaler on a daily basis, if they've ever been admitted to the intensive care unit, and if they've ever been intubated. And as we go up with daily uh, rescue use, um, frequent ED visits, hospitalization, hospitalizations, ICU admissions, and intubations, it increases the likelihood of needing that higher level of care again, but it also increases the likelihood of uh, death related to asthma. And kids who get intubated don't do well when they have asthma. It's really hard to wean them afterwards. Bronchiolitis uh, and RSV, uh, I wanted to kind of cover together. Um, so bronchiolitis or the respiratory syncytial virus, um, which can also cause bronchiolitis, especially in our kiddos who were preemie or had underlying respiratory issues, is an inflammation of the lower airways, uh, very similar to asthma, but where asthma is considered intermittent and reversible. Bronchiolitis is usually a direct result of some sort of viral infection. Um, pediatric airways don't handle edema or swelling well, and that can greatly um, impact their ability to exchange gases. This is highly contagious. Um, so if you or I were to develop RSV, we would probably just have a cough and a cold. Um, but we're very contagious to all of the children that were around. Uh, but child to child, this also is highly contagious and can cause uh, hospitalizations, um, even you know, PICU admissions for long periods of time or intubation. So it's really important that you wear not only eye protection and a mask, but also a gown because this is spread uh, by droplet as well as contact and it can carry over in your clothes from patient to patient. Children can also get pneumonia, just like adults. And this is an infection uh, in or around the alveoli or the parenchyma, so the lung tissue. Um, it impacts gas exchange. It can be in any of the five lungs lobes of the lungs. Um, so right upper, right middle, right lower, left upper, left lower, any combination of those. Um, different pathogens tend to infect um, different lobes and then aspiration oftentimes occurs more on the right side. Um, 
it can be viral, it can be fungal, it can be um, uh, obviously bacterial, but it also can be from like inhaling gastric contents. So it can be a chemical uh, pneumonia or what we refer to as pneumonitis, like inflammation of the lung tissue from aspiration. Um, kids with pneumonia tend to present with um, this same kind of uh, increased work of breathing. So tripod or sniffing position. Um, little kids tend to have nasal flaring that shows that they have air hunger. And kids with pneumonia oftentimes try to self peep. So if you think about your elderly patient with emphysema who breathes in and then purses their lips to exhale, a child doesn't know how to do that. That's actually something that we teach patients with emphysema to do. So instead they grunt and that grunt is that self peeping. So if you get this little kid who's like <coughs> with every breath, that's telling you, <coughs> excuse me, um, that's telling you that that child's really struggling to breathe. And we see that with things like heart failure, um, but primarily with things like pneumonia. Here we have an x-ray. This is a right upper lobe, right middle lobe, um, just to give you an idea. This is a, a young baby, and you can tell that because of the positioning. Um, we put uh, little kids in what's called a pigastat, which is like a just a clear kind of uh, circular device that forces their arms up above their head, um, and then that way it helps them like fully inflate their lungs so we can see what's going on. Um, so uh, remember when you're looking at an x-ray, um, that's always a backwards from, um, you know, what you would expect, right? So this is the right side uh, over here, and this is the patient's left over here. And uh, air shows up as dark, so all of this kind of consolidation in here is an ammonia. Um, and so we have the uh, right upper lobe, and we have the right middle lobe. Um, this is the heart. I'm trying to see my right here and then down here we have the diaphragm kind of going across there uh, this is our liver over here and then um, this gas bubble over here is systemic and those are a couple little farts hanging out um, so <clears throat> uh, when you're listening you really want to make sure that you're listening uh, anteriorly as well as posteriorly. So on the left side, you want to listen um, to the left chest, you know, kind of uh, at the top, like under the clavicle, and then kind of midline, and then uh, down at the base. And then the same is true on the right side. You want to listen at the top under the clavicle. You want to listen just um, laterally, so kind of towards that anterior axillary line at the fourth to fifth intercostal space um, on a kid, uh, because that's where you're going to best hear the middle lobe. You can't hear the middle lobe from the back on the right, um, and there is no middle lobe on the left, but you can't hear the middle lobe from the back. So you want to listen from the front or laterally, and then you want to listen in the base and then in the back again, you know, like you normally do, because um, you want to hear if they have any uh, crackles or wheezing or ronchi in that area. Pertussis is also known as whooping cough. And uh, pertussis is um, characterized, so it's, it's a bacterial infection. It's characterized by this um, paroxysmal <coughs> until like they can't cough anymore. And then this inspiratory whoop, when they breathe back in. All right, so like, <laughs> and that, that's kind of this pertussis. And you see like that, that child in that picture is um, coughing a lot. And obviously it's kind of irritating uh, to be coughing a lot, uh, but I want to tell you that pertussis is deadly. Um, so this is a picture of an infant who has pertussis and because it's caused so much airway swelling, the child needed to be put on ventilatory support. So this little kiddo is intubated and they have a feeding tube on a cardiac monitor. It's an SBO2 probe um, on their forehead and then a temperature probe on the side of their head.
Uh, but obviously, um, fever in kids causes them to breathe faster, which then causes an increased loss of um, hydration, right? So they're obligate nose breathers. When you breathe through your nose, it warms and it humidifies and it filters. And so the faster you're breathing in and out through your nose, um, the more fluid you're going to lose into the air as mist. So kids can actually get dehydrated, especially infants can get dehydrated just from the increased respiratory rate uh, and a fever. In older children, the um, such severity of the coughing can cause uh, hyphemas, which is where you get bleeding into the eyes. Um, and then you see here that this kid has like a periorbital ecchymosis, but that's just from coughing so hard. So he broke all these blood vessels in his face. Um, so those are, you know, basically started out as petechiae and now have become uh, ecchymotic areas as well. <clears throat> so pertussis is avoidable. It's vaccinatable. Um, as a child, again, two, four, and six months of age. And then um, again, around um, a year and then five years, they get DTAP. Uh, as you get older than 10, so your like 10 to 12 year uh, tetanus shot has pertussis in it, um, and then adults and the elderly. So the most common transmission of pertussis is actually from the elderly who their vaccination status is kind of worn out and then they get sick and they go see their grandbabies and they love them and kiss them and give them uh, pertussis. So we want to make sure people are vaccinated. All right, um, so last but not least, let's talk about some chronic diseases related to the respiratory system. Um, the first is cystic fibrosis. So cystic fibrosis is an autosomal recessive uh, genetic condition, and it impacts uh, chloride transport within the body that leads to these really thick respiratory GI and reproductive tract uh, mucus. So the child has um, a really hard time clearing secretions from the lungs, a hard time digesting um, and passing stool, and then um, many are sterile or have a hard time with reproduction. There's a loss of excessive electrolytes, sodium and chloride, especially through sweat. Um, and uh, people will say, you know, these babies taste salty, but diagnosis is through something called the chloride sweat test. Um, treatment at home is gonna include things like nebulizers, uh, postural drainage and percussion therapy where they kind of um, clop their hands on the child's back while they uh, alter like which side and um, top or bottom is down to help facilitate uh, mucus drainage and then uh, vibrations and so there are <clears throat> there's something called an acapella device which looks like a kazoo almost but it has this ball in it that rattles and when they blow into it it causes these vibrations that kind of rattle back down their chest and then there's also these like amazing vibration vests that kids can wear so while they're doing their nebs they're wearing this vibration vest that just kind of um, causes vibrations in the chest and loosens up all these secretions and really helps them clear it. Um, they'll be on uh, enzymatic replacement for eating, so pancreatic enzymes because the pancreatic duct usually gets plugged with the thick mucus and um, you know they have to eat a really a, a diet that's high in protein and calories and fat soluble vitamins because they don't absorb them well. Um, so typically if we get called to a cystic fibrosis keto, it is because they have gotten sick with a respiratory infection and death is usually related to respiratory infections in this population. Um, the life expectancy is much longer than it used to be. So when I was younger and starting out, it was uh, in your 20s. And now we have CF patients that are, you know, living well into their 50s and beyond. Um, so things to know, you are 
incredibly infectious to them. Um, so you're going to mask and gown and glove and sterilize yourself as best as you can um, to keep them healthy. So think of this almost as like protective isolation where you're protecting them from you. Um, and then, you know, they'll know what they need. So if they need a nebulizer, we can give them a nebulizer. If they need um, just like saline or cool mist nebulizer, we can do that as well. Um, and then we need to take them to the hospital where they get their cystic fibrosis care. So for destination determination, it's going to be really important that we take them someplace that has an inpatient cystic fibrosis unit. Um, cystic fibrosis patients tend to colonize bacteria that um, other people do not. Um, so it's also important that you do protect yourself, but they're also very dangerous to each other. So they have to stay, you know, certain six feet away from each other to make sure that they don't share uh, germs as well. And then bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So bronchopulmonary dysplasia or BPD is a um, respiratory uh, tissue problem of uh, prematurity. So we tend to see this in uh, kiddos who have prolonged oxygenation and ventilation with um, higher pressures. Um, and uh, so again, these tend to be our premature babies. The primary goal is prevention and the world of respiratory therapy has changed and they now have um, high frequency oscillation ventilators that do really like 300 small teeny tiny breaths per minute um, rather than uh, fewer breaths with higher pressure. This is like minimal pressure and 300 breaths. And that has really helped decrease the incidence of BPD. Once a child is diagnosed with BPD, they will have lifelong respiratory problems that include uh, things that appear very much like uh, COPD. So wheezing, accessory muscle use and retractions, cyanosis with exertion, uh, clubbing of the fingers from chronic hypoxia, failure to thrive is very common, so they won't hit the normal growth charts, and then uh, irritability from hypoxia. Um, so we won't ideally get called for this ever because these kids are, are in the NICU until they are you know, full term and then ready to be discharged. But we may get called for a child who has a respiratory complaint with a history of BPD. And what you need to recognize is that this just makes this child a much higher risk for fatigue, respiratory failure, and respiratory arrest. Um, so there's nothing really, you can't fix this. There's nothing really to do other than recognize that this is critical, provide oxygen, position of comfort, um, and transport as fast as you can. So how do we manage all of these patients? I already talked a little bit about asthma meds, but let's just talk about pediatric patients in general. Um, so when you're looking at pediatric patients, obviously the first thing is uh, airway, well, scene safety, and then airway. Um, so is their airway open or does it require positioning or suctioning or an adjunct, right? So gurgling is fluid, it needs suction. Snoring is the tongue, it needs positioning. And strider is an upper airway problem, but I can't fix that with positioning or an adjunct. You know, that's something that I could use uh, epinephrine for. Is it patent? So is, uh, am I concerned about a foreign body or inflammation or some sort of obstruction? And can they maintain it on their own? And so if they have altered mental status, then I know that there's a huge risk for that big floppy tongue to fall in the back of their airway and occlude their airway. So any child who does not have an, a gag reflex should receive an oral airway. Um, nasal airways typically tend to be used in kids over the age of one, just because under the age of one, their nasopharynx is so small that once you put the NPA in there, the opening for the NPA would be so little that you wouldn't really be able to move a lot of gas. Um, and then suction is needed. <coughs> Next, we're going to move on to breathing. So um, checking their rate, their depth, and their effort, and looking for any patterns in their respirations, you should always always without fail, manually count for 60 seconds, a respiratory rate to look at the pattern. 
oxygenation that's needed to maintain a sat that's appropriate for their age and condition, and then uh, ventilatory support as needed as well. So don't wait to provide positive pressure ventilations for the kiddo who needs it. A child who's breathing spontaneously, you would provide um, a breath every time they breathe in, and a child who is apneic and you're providing positive pressure ventilations for, you would breathe at a rate based on resuscitation guidelines. And then uh, pharmacological interventions would be next. So as I mentioned, um, alpha adrenergics like racemic epinephrine, IM epinephrine, um, those are good at decreasing um, capillary permeability. So they have localized vasoconstriction. They'll cause localized pallor and decrease blood flow to that area. Uh, drugs that you use like neosinephrine and afranasal spray are also alpha adrenergic drugs that work on the nasal mucosa. Bronchodilators then um, are things like our albuterol and leave albuterol, which are beta-2 agonists, and then ipratropium is uh, an anticholinergic bronchodilator. Bronchodilators have the common side effects of uh, tachycardia, uh, fine motor tremors, like you know tremors in the, the hands or the fingers. Um, again, they may initially increase cough as secretions are mobilized. In large doses, albuterol can cause diarrhea, and in large doses, ipratropium can cause urinary retention. Since uh, kids have such a small cardiovascular system, the younger they are, the more um, uh, kind of symptomatic they'll become with changes in heart rate. So um, don't get too worked up if they're tachycardic and their blood pressure is pretty high. It should go back down. Steroids can also be used. So things like dexamethasone, solumedrol, those can be used um, for uh, inflammatory respiratory complaints. Uh, but it's important to remember that steroids increase blood glucose. So if you have a child who's receiving steroids, um, their uh, blood sugar fingers, like their finger stick or heel stick is going to be high. And um, steroids, because they're an immune suppressant, increase the risk of infection. So a child who's been on steroids for, let's say they put them on steroids for croup, now has an increased risk of infection, like, you know, a secondary sinus infection or bronchitis or UTI or skin infection or whatever. Um, and then, um, <clears throat> you know, from their primary care of the hospital, they'll get uh, antibiotics. Um, but for us, we can do cool mist nebulizers and then fever and pain management as well. So overall, it's important to use an organized approach to your assessment. You need to know the normal values by age. And these aren't things that you need to memorize as much as just have a peripheral brain, right? So have like a chart or something that it's easy for you to find and look up. Um, it's, you know, I can give you all of the uh, kind of tricks in the world to try to remember how to calculate things on your own. But two o'clock in the morning when you have a five-year-old who's not breathing, you're not going to want to do math in the back of the ambulance. So you want to have something in writing like those cheat sheets that just help you not screw things up. Recognize the signs of respiratory distress and intervene prior to respiratory failure and arrest. Recognize the hallmark signs of epiglottitis and avoid causing spasms so that, you know, high fever, sudden onset, drooling and hoarse voice. That's epiglottitis all the way. Take appropriate precautions for all of these infectious disorders to protect yourself and your other patients and your family at home, and then provide support for the patients and their families, especially when they have chronic diseases, because that can be very scary. All right, thanks for watching. This is Respiratory Emergencies for Pediatrics in a Nutshell. Um, and as always, I'll see you in the next one.